Well, good afternoon, everybody. Early evening, late afternoon. Thank you all for being here. That's thank you to those present physically in this room and to lots of people online today. Uh, my name is Paul Lakeland. I direct the Center for Catholic Studies, and this event is one of three afternoon workshop sort of things this semester under the general heading of uh, just universities, corporatization, and the Catholic university. Uh, I'm not going to try and explain what corporatization is because one of our distinguished panel here will tackle that topic. Um, on my left here, my immediate left is Professor Caitlin Merritt, who teaches in the Religious Studies Department. And to her left is Professor Gail Alberta, who teaches in the politics department. And they'll be picking up uh, after me, I'm just gonna say a few introductory things, then hand it over to them for some comments and conversation, and hopefully uh, some questions from you as we go ahead here. Um, a word to those of you online, uh, you probably know this by now, but obviously uh, you can't just raise your hand and ask a question. This is a webinar format. It doesn't work like just a regular Zoom meeting, but you can uh, write a question in the Q&A box that you'll see on your screen. And you can do that at any time during the talk that anything any of us say strikes you and you want to, you want to ask the question, not wait till the end. You can type the question in and then one of the jobs I will have will be to to pass the questions along at the end of our session to uh, whoever seems likeliest to be able to answer them. So that's the format. We'll be here for about an hour. If we get really excited, we might be an hour and five minutes, but that's, that's <laughs> about it, right? So good. So um, some of you, I see some students here and there are probably some online. So some of you will a lot of the terminology here will be new to you. Some of you, it's old hat. So either way, you have to exercise a bit of understanding. So if I tell you that the background theoretical issue here is something called Catholic social teaching, which has been around for oh, 130 years in that format. And even back at its beginning in 1891, it focused on labor issues. It focused on unionization. It focused on the right to free collective bargaining. It talked about a living wage. It talked about employer labor relations. It was a very forward looking document. And since then, there have been multiple further documents in that tradition, each one addressing the social context of Catholic uh, teaching uh, some way or another. So that's the topic, that's the, the theoretical background that will be discussed in all three of our sessions this semester. So uh, next month, we'll be looking at the question of how we serve the underserved. How does a Catholic private university manage to address that part of its mission that says we have to we have to take care of those who are not able to simply buy their way into whatever they want to buy their way into or whatever so the underserved population will be the topic for uh, next month and the month after that it will be an issue of, of looking at racial justice on university campuses this by the way this is not about fairfield university it's about Catholic universities in general, perhaps Jesuit universities in particular, and Fairfield shares in all of the problems and challenges of all these institutions, but this is not narrowly focused upon Fairfield. So if that's what's happening in March and April, then here in February, we're going straight to the heart of that early Catholic social teaching document back in 1891. And we're asking about the implications of a concern for justice for workers in the context of a Catholic private university. 
predominantly, I guess, will talk about the living wage. Well, I'm going to leave it to these two to open that up. But I will just say one thing. On a campus like this or any other Jesuit or Catholic university, there are two groups of people for whom you have to have the most care in terms of making sure they have a living wage. One group who we will not be focusing on today are uh, staff, university staff, everybody from those who empty the trash cans to the people who work in, in student affairs and so on. Those are full-time employees with benefits, and it's clear there that the university needs to pay a living wage to those people. The other group who are the ones that we are more concerned with today are the people who are employed in the academic division part-time. So what we sometimes call adjunct faculty, or we sometimes call affiliate faculty, and there are a number of other terms too. For the students here, many of you have no idea when you take a class with someone, whether that person is a full-time faculty member on a tenure track or tenured or whatever, or that person is an affiliate faculty member who is teaching one or two courses here and maybe more somewhere else and so on. Mostly you have no idea because it's not the quality of their teaching that is the issue. Those people represent a challenge to any private Catholic institution because the issue there is systemic. When you're paying someone for a course, how do you determine a living wage since you're not responsible for what other courses they might be teaching somewhere else? And, how, and therefore, you're probably asking yourself questions about things like how many of our faculty ought to be in this rather insecure position with a, a salary for a course and no benefits. There are, or there were, the, the data here is a little bit out of date, but less than 10 years. There were about 1.8 million faculty teaching in universities and colleges across this country. 1.8 million about, I think probably about six years ago. Of that 1.8 million, 1.3 million had no access to tenure in the institution in which they worked. And of that 1.3 million, approximately half of them, 700,000 of them held adjunct positions, which means they got a course here, they got a course there, they got a course there, good luck making a living and no benefits. So the issue of labor justice applies to staff and it applies, the living wage issue applies particularly to these adjunct or affiliate faculty. So as we go through this, that's not the only thing we're talking about, but that's probably where you're going to find the issues most clearly um, laid out. So I'm going to stop there for now. I'm going to turn it over to Professor Alberta. She'll be followed by uh, Professor Merritt, and then we'll see where we are with questions and comments and discussions as we go through the rest of the hour. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Dr. Lakeland. Um, so hi, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm just going to start off with a brief overview of this idea of corporatization and just how we kind of came to be in this position as a nonprofit um, group of institutions. So this is going to be like a very broad, it like a uh, overview, not specific to obviously Fairfield or you know any one particular college. So for the most part, starting with Harvard uh, as our first uh, nation's first. Um, institution of higher learning, it really was considered, um, you know, a, a public good, right? That we were going to 
have these institutions that help to better citizens, right? Help the lives of individuals, help better society, um, contributed to knowledge, things along those lines, okay? Uh, and that was mainly the model for many, many years. It's why most universities, right, are nonprofit. Um, then we have, uh, as we kind of move through time, we have a couple things happening that are important to keep in mind for the purposes of this discussion today. One is the changes in the labor market for who gets to do what, right? As well as the policy changes that were made at the federal level, as well as just some cultural uh, shifts that occurred within the nation that changed uh, universities into this uh, more of a uh, profit seeking orientation. So first being, um, you know, if we all go way back in time, right, men were predominantly the ones who were in the workforce and providing women were covered under coverture um, laws, which literally covered their legal existence, um, or got absorbed by their husband. So most of the time, we didn't see women actually working in the workplace. And if they did, they were unmarried women. Um, and that was pretty much the status quo until about then, you know, early 1900s, where then we started to see where right, we have World War One, followed by World War Two, um, men going abroad to serve that left factories empty, right? And, and also a rise in more access to college institutions. So those two things are going on at the same time. And with that comes women entering the workplace um, and a change in societal norms of that married woman could also enter the workplace and not you know, be a stay-at-home mom and um, you know, child care provider and doing the housework and things along those lines. So it's a hefty responsibility, don't get me wrong, um, by any means. Um, and that is a huge contribution to not only the family unit, but, you know, the society as a whole. Um, but we see these shifts, right? So women are starting to enter the workplace um, and not just unmarried women. Uh, we're starting to see married women entering the workplace. We see technology on the rise. So you have... Um, what you know were called back then secretarial positions. Um, you had women serving in the factories while the men were, you know, abroad fighting in the war, um, and things like workplace uh, safety precautions. Right, it came out of the progressive era movement. So now the workplaces became, you know, uh, cleaner and more safe. So women you know, felt more comfortable going into those places and society felt more comfortable with women going into those places. At the same time, we have um, individuals attending universities and it starts to open up to and in including women um, during this, this process as well. And so that, you know, occurs like, you know, the early 1900s and kind of moving forward into about the 1970s. And that's where we're gonna see some major policy changes. So in and around that era, what we see is that the um, idea of colleges and universities and higher education being a um, public good, something that is used for, right? Helps shapes us, grows us as a society, et cetera, et cetera. It switches to um, a notion of it being a private good. Okay. And if it becomes a private good, then there is a consumer. Okay. And, and then there is profit to be had. So, um, and that came a little bit under, you know, the Reagan era, uh, you know, as well. He, he really did jump on this and it, it had a lot to do with too, that again, these cultural shifts were changing in the United States. So we started, you know, access, right. We started seeing more women go to college. Um, Tuition costs for a lot of schools were relatively low. Um, federal government and state governments paid a lot of um, dollars to keep these institutions up and running. And this era was really emphasized policy-wise with an idea of accountability and efficiency. Okay, we started seeing those words come in, into play. And then there became, well, how accountable are higher ed, you know, education institutions when, you know, we see their presidents making so much and their coaches making this and professors are putting out this kind of research, right? There became this call by society for this accountability. And so you have that coupled with um, 
a slow movement toward public perception of colleges becoming a private good, okay, something that then benefits the consumer, which is our students, right? Um, that created some policy changes. So then it became, okay, so if we start viewing colleges as this private institution or private good, then someone's got to flip the bill. So we can charge students more in order for them to come and then the state and federal government stopped paying for it. So then there's no call for this accountability in the same ways that there was. So you kind of put all that together and you get kind of where we're at today. So you get um, large in a growing number of individuals coming to colleges on student loans. You get high student debt um, upon leaving colleges because in, the price of tuition is just skyrocketed. Okay, it, one study showed hold on, that since 1978, the cost of college has increased in absolute dollars by 1,120%. That's huge, right? Um, and so with that, if you have this consumer, which is our students, then, you know, the idea of the customer is always right, right, comes into play. So that plays a role not only in faculty lives with things like grading and along those lines, but then also about what is going to attract that consumer to our institution. And then it became, becomes almost like an arms race. So what we see since the 1980s and kind of pushing forward is, you know, oh, we have a new lab at our school. So our competitor is going to get a new lab. We have a pool at our school. Oh, well, then now we're going to have a pool and a lazy river, right? So students, so it becomes this arms race to continuously one up and become that shining institution. Uh, but that takes money, right? And so where do you get that from? And if your university doesn't have that money, that means they're probably taking out debt for it. So who gets to carry that burden? the consumers, right? You pass it on just like a retail agency would or any other corporation. You pass it on to the buyers and the buyers are the students. So there goes your tuition again. And then at the same time, we have this going on, you start to see this emergence of rankings, right? Um, they're always around, but the importance of them becomes even greater. So the World News and Report, right? Um, they do college rankings, everything from uh, the dormitory food, to parking, to student life, to how awesome your professors are, to tuition costs, everything kind of gets asked, right? They send out surveys to students. Students answer those surveys from institutions across the nation. They then look at things like graduation rates and tuition dollars and all these other things. And then all that data gets compiled into the rankings that come out every year. So in order to keep right up on the rankings, you got to have students who are going to give you good rankings, which means then you're competing for good food, good dorms, the best dorm, the most updated dorm, right? Um, the, the best amount of services, uh, be it student life or uh, rec centers or, you know, new parking spots, facilities, et cetera. And so again, it kind of, it, it almost fuels itself, right? In that way. So then in order to deal with that, right? Universities have to make that switch from, oh, we're not just here to contribute, right? To knowledge and society and, and cultivate, um, uh, you know, our young, uh, our youth, but now we need to make a dollar because now we have to pay back the money for that lazy river that we just put in next to our pool, right? Or that private student parking ramp or the new dormitories that have, you know, all the the fancy features. Um, and in order to do that, then you start looking at how the university can start to reassess or adjust, or the other word to use is cut, right? Costs. And, um, and a lot of times the easiest thing to do is where the, the most money is. Well, the most money tends to lie with who offers the services, right? The educators. Um, and so that's, you know, to go back to what Dr. Lakeland was saying is, that's where we start to see the shift. You know, the result of this is the shift to um, contingent faculty. Okay, you're still getting a PhD uh, to teach you. You're just getting it at like one tenth or lower of the cost, right? So you can either pay a full time professor. Uh, do you look up the average of what faculty make? 
average nationally? Yeah, for our sal salaries. I don't have it off the top of my head. For our kind of institution, the average is probably around 110,000. Okay. So instead of paying a full for a full-time faculty, so instead of paying 110,000 for full-time faculty, you can uh, get your students taught by a person with the same degree for like five or six K, right? So now you get to hire four or five people to teach a course um, or teach four or five courses when full-time faculty, like our institution, we teach three courses a semester. Um, so you get, it's cost savings, right? It makes financial sense from a business for-profit standpoint, right? Um, and that's kind of where the conversation that we're about to engage in is going to unfold, is now we're in this place. Here's how we got there. Now what, okay, now that we're here. Um, and I'm going to wrap that up and hand, hand the mic over. It's kind of depressing, I'm sorry. <laughs> This is also quickly turning into a game of hot potato, which is always fun. Um, <laughs> so what we just set up, right, is there, there's two main things that we can think about in this conversation as immediately relevant to the three of us sitting at this table. The first is that because of these balance, these balances of costs, a class system emerges in a faculty system that is not necessarily based on credentials or experience, but a big part of it is luck of the draw. Mm -hmm. Is that, are we? Yeah, I think yeah. that's a good term. Um, <clears throat> so we have, right, kind of this, just we'll work in some definitions too for a little bit. When people think about the wine and cheese wood paneled life of the academic, they're thinking about a full-time tenured professor. That means that that is someone, <laughs> we'll just work across the table. Uh, <laughs> um, that Where's means- my wine and cheese? I know, after Paul. Um, that person has contributed greatly to their university, not just in the form of teaching, but also so in the form of research and publication and service to their university. So it is not all daffodils and rainbows. There's work that goes into it. Um, and that takes a while. There's a process in which faculty members are hired and they are more often than not hired on what is called a tenure track. So those people, are given a carrot at the end of their labor conceivably and that they're engaging in a process that is going to give them job security, a livable wage and academic freedom, which is important. Besides that, right? People who are working towards that goal and are supported by the institution in their work towards that goal are called assistant professors more often than not and they're working towards tenures. They're working towards that job security and that academic freedom. And then the class that we're focusing on are these contingent or adjunct faculty and visiting professors also fall into this category as well. And these are professors who are not even hourly employees. They're considered part-time employees, but they're really contract workers. They are contracted from the first day of the semester to the last day of a semester to provide credit hours for a course. And again, they have the same academic background and often experience as assistant and um, tenured professors. So they don't have job security. They're hired from semester to semester. Um, there are adjuncts who go on unemployment in the interim because they don't have an income. Um, so when everybody else is quote unquote on break, these people might be on unemployment or they might have another job. Um, and they also don't have any job security. They may not be invited back for another semester. And then there are other things as well that they are maybe not having a, an institutional affiliation to publish or research. 
Um, and they are also not serving the university. Adjunct faculty are not required to act as advisors to students, for example, or sit on committees or even necessarily attend faculty meetings. So from an economic point of view, there's certainly a trade-off in terms of responsibility. I'm gonna put the Catholic theologian hat on. <laughs> and the other thing that I want us to focus on as a result of this class system that we all just talked about is that there is a lens through which to see this in terms of quantity, which is important from an economic solvent point of view. And then there is another lens to look at this through quality. And that is particularly important at Catholic institutions grounded in Catholic social teaching. So for Catholic social teaching, right, which did start in 1891 and has been around and has been talked about by many, many popes and many, many bishops and many, many people, including academics. <laughs> the question at the heart of this is where is the human being? So if you notice, almost everything that we've talked about so far has been about dollar signs, and we have very rarely mentioned the human being. So when we think about things like a living wage, or what Catholic social teaching doesn't actually call a living wage, but a just wage, which is due to workers, where, where is the human in all of that, right? When we think about things like working conditions, is that just a matter of punching a clock? Or where is the human element in that? And this is a very poignant conversation regardless of the conditions in which we are living, but COVID has also amplified this with realities like the economic depression that's been associated with it, as well as things like adjunct faculty not having access to medical benefits. So they are asked to enter into a situation or an environment where their likelihood of infection is increased, but they are not protected in any way. And is it the role of the university, particularly a Catholic university, to engage in that question? So those are all kind of the things that we have floating around. And um, I kind of want to toss it over to Paul a little bit, but... <laughs> that idea of, right, that idea of where the human comes into this is what is at stake. Um, so Catholic social teaching, right, is rooted in the dignity of the human person, a human person by the sheer fact that they are a human person is supposed to be protected. And that falls into workers' rights because Catholic social teaching also posits that humans have a duty to work. So part of your expression as a developed human being is to go out into the world and not only make yourself a better person and realize your vocation through your work, but to also make the world around you better. And yeah, I guess I can end there. So before, before I give it to you, Dr. Lakeland, I'm going to, I'm going to steal it back for a second. Um, so two things I want um, you to keep in the back of your mind while we continue this conversation, just so we're all on the same page is um, the first being that it is very hard for us as individuals, let alone a society to imagine that someone with a high degree, be it a master's degree, sometimes contingent faculty have a master's degree. And more often, right, we have um, contingent faculty with um, a PhD. And it's really hard for us to wrap our heads around the fact that someone can have a terminal degree, terminal degree, PhD, MD, or a juris, and be poor. Like that, those two things seem not to go together, right? And, but yet they do. And not just poor, like colloquially speaking, but like earning under the poverty line. Like that, right. that's a line in the sand. That we should yeah. And, and having to, you know, seek out other benefits, right? Such as uh, maybe food assistance or unemployment or, um, you know, yeah, um, things along those lines. So it, it, I think that's half the battle, right? Is that we need to accept the fact that a degree does not equal um, a position and, and money. 
right? Um, a degree simply means that you're capable of those things and you've worked very hard and you've done very well. And I would like to say you're also, you know, fairly smart um, to, to do those things, but um, it, it does not follow, right? It is not a guarantee. Um, and, you know, like I started off as an adjunct um, back in the day, years ago. Uh, the second thing I want us to think about is how do we define what a living wage is? Um, which is, I think, a really important thing to uh, talk about. Now, I, I will let um, my the folks sitting on either side of me um, deal with it in like the Catholic um, social teaching aspect. Um, I will deal with it from the political aspect, um, since that is my wheelhouse, and say at least this. This has been a question that we have asked ourselves uh, like all the time. It's why we have a poverty line in the United States. Um, and back in the day, how we decided what a poverty line is, and to some degree, this is um, uh, the practice of determining that is reminiscent of this practice, but you would have a basket of like a, a basket and you would go to the grocery store. They would send people out um, from all over the right to the United States to various towns and cities and, and stuff. And they would put um, groceries in that basket for what they would assume would be a family of four, okay? And they would take, they would then cash out, take those receipts, and determine how much you needed to make sure that you could have that basket of food. Okay, um, so that was kind of how this policy of the poverty line became. Now, the reality is, is uh, the poverty line um, doesn't always reflect the reality, right? Um, one can be just above the poverty line and still be very poor and impoverished. Okay, um, so just because you met that that bar doesn't mean you know your life is grand. Um, and most time you're working multiple jobs. So that is part one. And then part two is um, our, the environment in which we've worked has changed. So back in the day, and when I say back in the day, I mean like long time ago, um, right? The, the men worked, the women took care of the home and raised the children and the sons, right? Were taught how to work on the farm, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and obviously this is ignoring a significant group experience, right? Those who have been enslaved, um, whose labor was for free, but it, that was how it was. And then, so it was a, it was a single earner income, right? And women couldn't do it anyways, because they were covered under their husband. And if it wasn't their husband, it was their father. Um, and then we moved into this as we, you know, kind of went through the wars and women became more involved in the workplace um, and these societal notions got more accepting. Then we see this dual earner income, okay? And that became very prevalent in the like late 19, um, the late 1900s where we saw this dual income becoming more and more of an acceptable thing. And in some cases, a necessary thing, okay? And then you add to that, uh, the trends with regards to what is a family and the trends to what are like, what, you know, when do we have children um, are also vastly different, right? Um, more often than not, uh, women are waiting longer uh, to have until they're older to have children. Um, most, uh, I don't want to say most, it's probably not an accurate word to use. Um, a decent amount of women in academia uh, postpone any sort of reproductive um, anything uh, until they get that golden ticket of tenure because then they are secure, right? Um, in, in, their, um, in their job. Um, and, and then just again, also like what, what is a, a household now too? Um, you know, whether it's same sex households or single parent households or multifamily households, right? That, that notion changes. So those things, and then how many kids we have? Um, you know, my great grandfather was like one of like 12 or 13 or something like that. My dad was one of nine. And then there there's, you know, I have one. <laughs> so that number trickled down real fast. Right. And, and that's okay. But then what does that mean? Right. Um, as we kind of walk through this, and other people don't, other people have more. So those are the things that I just want to throw out at you to keep in mind as these two take it over now with this you know, the Catholic aspect. Yeah. And I think that that is important because when the living wage was introduced along with many things in Catholic social teaching, it did account for this idea that you were not just making money for yourself, but you were making money to support your family. Um, so it was reflective in this single income reality. The other things that it includes 
is also that you won't be working all the time, right? Um, that you do have some semblance of fulfillment outside of your work as well. And, and this is kind of an interesting point um, uh, that gives us a little bit of leeway into a future oriented conversation as well. And whether that should play into labor conditions is that your wage should also allow you to save for the future. Go. <laughs> and you know what, what Caitlin is quoting from here was written in 1891. When the Pope at the time said, he talked about a living wage, and he said it's a wage earned by one wage earner, which is enough money to care for his spouse, his children, to have a decent place to live, and to save a little bit for the future. Very few people, even very few middle class people, could manage that today. But the 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 extra thing I want to add, which which sort of radicalizes the conversation just a little bit is to build on what Caitlin said about the importance of human dignity, the dignity of the individual, the absolute equality of all individuals before God and before the law is also the, added to that is the, the important gloss in Catholic social teaching that the individual is always already in a community not an isolated individual. So if you look at corporatization or neoliberalism or whatever you want to talk about today, it's a stress on the individual, individual rights, the right to do my thing and so on. And the Catholic tradition is considerably countercultural to that, insisting that it's not the individual, it's the individual in community. So it's the shape of the community that is important. And that leads to, in what in many ways, to my mind anyway, is the, the most important notion in Catholic social teaching today, and that's the idea of the common good. Now, the common good does not mean the utilitarian, the greatest good of the greatest number. It's not that. The idea of the common good in Catholic social teaching actually comes from the Hebrew prophets. And in today's understanding, it's this, that the common good of society, this is the good of all, measured by the quality of the attention you pay to the most vulnerable members of your society. So globally, we should be concerned for the two-thirds world who don't have enough to live on. Nationally, we should be concerned with the, whatever it is, 20, 25, 30% of people who live below the poverty line. And you can ask that question about every single kind, every single institution, global, national, regional, local, or any university, or any private university, or any Jesuit Catholic university. The principle of the common good is not debatable in Catholic social teaching. If, your, if the structure of your institution is not doing its damnedest to protect the least, to protect the most vulnerable members of your society, then you are not following your mission. You're not doing what you should be doing. Now, Come back to what I said at the beginning. That's easy to say, if it's difficult to do, maybe it's easy to say when you're talking about full-time employees, because you know your responsibility to them is to give them decent benefits and a decent salary. When you start talking about affiliate faculty, you don't control how the use of affiliate faculty relates to the individual affiliate faculty members' quality of life. You know, they could be an international lawyer dropping in to teach a course in the business school. That doesn't matter so much, but mostly they're not. Mostly they're exactly the way that Caitlin uh, describes them. There was a study <coughs> done by a Catholic uh, justice organiza organization about six years ago 
And uh, the man who did it uh, worked was, a, he taught uh, foreign languages at Georgetown University. So that was his context, but he tried to figure out what would be a fair wage <clears throat> to pay per course to an adjunct faculty member. And he came up with $6,800 per course. That would translate into about $40,000 a year, if you could imagine them teaching a full load, three and three, um, which I don't think most of us would consider to be a living wage, particularly not if it had no benefits. And at the time at which he made that calculation, only 7% of American Catholic universities were living up to that mark. Now, Catholic universities have no choice. I mean, they may make a bad choice, but they have no choice if they are going to, as we do, proclaim our commitment to our mission and identity. We have no choice but to try to address the issue of the common good. How you address it is tricky. One of the things that you can do, which we haven't said yet, and which actually I do believe here at Fairfield we are beginning to address, is adjusting the balance or readjusting the balance between affiliate faculty and full-time faculty. Not necessarily tenure track faculty, but full-time faculty, visiting professors, uh, Caitlin mentioned the visiting professors. They're usually here for one, two, three years. Um, they are hired at what I think is a living wage and they have full benefits. They don't have job security, but they, there isn't a single adjunct faculty member at Fairfield University who wouldn't kill for a job as the visiting professor. They'd probably kill the, uh, the guys like me who get the wine and cheese and the wood. <laughs> But uh, so, so we have a way to go here, not just us, everybody, but we have a way to go, but we know the way we have to go if we are faithful to the mission of the institution. And that means a commitment to Catholic social teaching. We have to keep asking the question, are we paying a living wage to our full-time employees? By and large, certainly at Fairfield, by and large, I'd say we are, by and large. I'm sure there are exceptions among the staff, the more uh, junior members of the staff. Junior means the ones who get paid less, but who do the most important work, like clearing the garbage. You know, if you, the garbage is not cleared, you notice. Um, so for them, it's, are we paying them a living wage for our affiliate adjunct faculty is what can we do to be more just and to some extent at least to address the balance in the institution between full-time and part-time faculty. In an ideal faculty, of course, everyone on the faculty would be full-time except for some who had particular skills to offer and didn't want to be full-time. So they came in to teach a particular course, you know, which used to be the way. When I was ahead of, uh, when I was the chair of the religious studies department 25 years ago, we had one adjunct faculty member. Five years ago, I think we had about 10. I think now we may have more like six or seven. I think we are beginning to adjust that and we should be, not just because it's just, it's just. And just, Paul did an excellent job of talking about the, the living wage, just to address the second part of our, the title of our talk is also working conditions, right? And the idea of, um, what an employee owes its institution and what an institution owes its employee. Um, and I think this also sets up a really interesting conversation of when adjuncts do need to take a number of courses at a number of different institutions in order to support themselves financially, that also puts them at a disadvantage 
<clears throat> excuse me, in terms of their future career development. So if someone is teaching a number of courses that may preclude them from doing their own research and publishing so that when they are applying for a full-time, possibly tenure track job, they may actually be at a disadvantage, even though they may have five, 10, et cetera, years of teaching experience, the university may look more positively on someone with less teaching experience, but more research and publications. So by participating in this system, they are almost disenfranchising themselves, not just in the immediate present, but also in the future as well. The other thing that's kind of interesting from a Catholic social teaching point of this is that the way to escape oppression is to become an oppressor in a certain point of view. The idea that many institutions sometimes put adjuncts and full-time faculty at odds with one another is something that also should be discussed. That hasn't ever been my experience, um, but it is something you'll see this red book up here um, that some people who look at, at this topic do talk about um, that in order to get into a full-time position, that means that you do have the benefit of teaching less courses and there'll be adjuncts who pick up the courses so that you can do your research. So that kind of cyclical nature is also something that we don't need to go into much detail about, but it's just something to kind of put out there um, that there's a lot going on. This is not an easy situation to, to talk about or to say like, oh, well, if they just did ABC, Catholic universities would be fine. This is very muddy and very complicated. And that's why we're having conversations like this. So just to piggyback <laughs> off of what they're both saying here, I ran uh, a couple numbers really quick based on uh, Dr. Lakeland's um, average rate of salaries, um, our knowledge of our average adjunct uh, salaries mm -hmm. across the, the nation. Just to give you an idea of how many courses that um, a contingent faculty member would need to teach in order to make what a full-time tenure track professor makes. That is 20 a year. Okay. Um, that, that's, that's low balling it too, by the way. Um, so that equates to six or seven per semester. If you can teach that in the summer as well, if not, that's at least 10 every semester. Okay. I have, I'm, um, an assistant professor here. Um, tenure track. And so I teach three classes a semester. Um, Paul, you teach three, yes, classes a semester? No, I'm, I'm privileged. I teach two. Ooh. But that's because I run the Center for Catholic right. Studies. Yeah. So I'm technically everybody teaches three on, on a tenure track. Right. Some, and by the way, those people you're talking about who'd have to teach 20 courses, they still wouldn't get any benefits. No. So that's no benefits, no health care. That's no 401ks or 413Bs, um, that is, and that's also probably not going to be 10 courses each semester at the same institution, right? So back when I was an adjunct, um, uh, back in the day uh, also, so long, long time ago, no, just kidding, I'm not that far away. Uh, <laughs> I was at three to four institutions at, at any given moment. Um, the closest institution was about a 20 minute drive. Uh, the farthest I drove to teach um, was about an hour and a half one way. Um, that, so that's not round trip. Um, and I would try and get five to six courses every semester to make just the, the basics work. Um, and then, you know, kind of continue on from there. Um, so that just gives you an idea. And it's not just the other thing that I want to highlight that maybe not be a misnomer to folks in this room or even our folks that are watching it online, but can be a misnomer in general is, um, I teach three classes. That's, you know, three times three credit hours a piece, three times three, right. We get nine. Oh, you teach nine. You, you work nine hours a week. Don't we all wish, right. Um, the amount of prep that goes into your teaching 
for each lecture, the amount of prep that goes into your course design and what readings you're going to have your students do, the type of work you're going to have your students do when you're creating the course, then actually doing the course and then and running it and teaching it, you know, in the classroom, those, you know, three hours a week. And then you follow that up with your grading, your um, getting ready, your writing your exams, you're writing the prompts for essays, right? Um, all of that plays a role, but we don't really think about it in that way. So I, um, I think it was the other day when we were yes. talking, she did a quick and dirty analysis and it averaged out to be how much per hour? Less than $2 an hour. This is for, this is, for this is not at Fairfield. Faculty. Yeah. yeah for adjunct adjunct faculty. Faculty. Because they have the same re uh, preparation <laughs> requirements that the rest of us do. They may not be doing committee work, but so if you look at the, what they're paid and you figure out how many hours they have to put into it, it comes out $2 an hour, which is a little bit below minimum wage. If you think just, about just that. The same. Now we're getting to the point where we probably should see if we have some yeah. questions. Excellent. So I have one online here and I'm sure there'll be more, but is there anyone in the, in the auditorium has a question? Keith, would you mind coming to the mic so that anybody online can actually hear you? <laughs> this is our- And just to put the $2 thing in perspective, that it is less than what your wait staff makes. Um, so just think about that. Thanks. So I'm Keith Maskowitz, I'm the director of campus ministry. One of the things that I noticed is missing from the conversation are uh, labor unions. Yes. And the church has a rich teaching and wants to embrace labor unions, but also is, has a horrible track record internally with labor unions. So I wonder if you might talk a little bit about that. Yeah, Thanks. it does, it does. I remember, uh, this is 35 years ago now, there was movement to, um, uh, to, uh, to bring, some of the staff, and in those days we had many more staff who actually were hired by the university. It wasn't sort of farmed out. And um, the, the movement uh, of labor unions to get on to, to come to Fairfield to organize labor. Uh, I remember the director of human resources at that time saying in a public meeting, there are strangers among us. <laughs> so that was the warning. And what, what what uh, Father Keith says there is exactly right, that in theory, going back to 1891, we have a terrific record on the importance, the, uh, the, the importance of labor unions. And lately, an abysmal record, not here, hasn't come up here lately, but it's come up at a number of Jesuit institutions and some other Catholic institutions that have simply tried to prevent unions being formed, uh, especially for uh, adjunct faculty and in the bigger institutions for graduate students who are doing a lot of the teaching anyway. And, um, and you know, the role of the labor- Could you union. justify that please? Yeah, so <laughs> the role of the labor union, just you know, kind of think about it from this, you know, historical political context. Um, and by no means am I a labor union expert, um, but it they serve they serve an important purpose, right? Um, one, they they give us our um our what our minimum wage. I was like, what is that word? Our minimum wage, they um vacation time, weekends off right? Uh, Labor Day, um, work, workplace safety, okay? All of these things that we kind of come to know were part of not only the labor movement, but also this, you know, this progressive movement um, out of the, you know, the 1920s, 1930s, where we were trying to kind of reform a bunch of things. Um, so they, they do play a role. And there is something to be said, right, about collective action. Uh, if we get together, there's power in numbers. If we get together and you demand something, it is vastly different than when a single person demands something. Um, and so, you know, that is also, you know, one of the reasons why it's in, you know, then to put it in the private sector kind of, or this private good corporate corporatization thing, it is better for corporations in general to have fire at will employees, 
right? Um, because then if you're not performing, right, they can let you go. If they can hire someone to do the same work just as good for less, it works, right? Um, because their bottom line again is profit. But when you transfer that into an institution of higher learning, right, um, like our colleges and universities, that be that could become problematic um, because then you're um, not allowing your scholars to do their their work and contribute to knowledge and and teach the youth and and do those things. So uh, again, just a different kind of perspective. But yeah, and as Father Keith mentioned unions are part of Catholic social teaching. Um, they are seen as a good in helping achieve that common good that Professor Lagan was talking about. Um, and we have seen some Catholic universities that have embraced and used unions in terms of their contingent faculty as well as their graduate students, which is also an, an important population to acknowledge at some universities. And then there are other universities, you know, at the very other side of that, that have discouraged it, but somewhere in the middle, right? We always have to remember that idea of community um, and that this idea of working together and talking openly with each other and knowing where responsibility lies, whether that does come in the form of a union or not, is also at the heart of Catholic social teaching. Um, and that is maybe another way to think about it as well. Okay, so I have a couple of things online here. Um, one from uh, Professor Betsy Bowen in the English department, and she says this. She's always looking out for students. She says this. Thank you all. I think that was us mainly. One point that may speak to students is that they too are being shortchanged by the system because affiliate faculty aren't being paid to advise, write letters of reference, serve on committees that get necessary work done. There are fewer faculty available to support students in all kinds of ways. Parenthesis, I know that some affiliate faculty do these things anyway, but they're not obliged to. Then we have one question, which is a huge one. I don't know that we're going to have time to answer it, but William Deegan asks this. In your description of the issues, the three of us, what are your thoughts on solutions to these issues, both from inside the university and from outside the university? So I have a comment, I, something came in my head on Betsy's question that I think can relate to that. So one of the, the things that was highlighted um, by Caitlin was that, you know, contingent faculty usually are not in uh, department meetings, right? They're not usually part of the general faculty meetings. Um, so you're not in the, in the places where the decisions get made, you know, or as, you know, the Hamilton musical says, you're not, you know, you're not in the room, uh, where it happens. So, um, part of the answer to that for, you know, that question is the idea that universities as a whole needs to shift how we include contingent faculty and allowing them. Now I'm not saying exploit them more, like being like, Hey, so come serve on this committee and PS, we're not going to pay you for it. Um, but if they have access to the table, if they can pull their chair up to the table, that means their voice is getting heard. And if their voices get heard, that leads to policy change, um, ideally, right? Or at least that's the circle. Um, if you can't even sit at the table, how is that ever going to start happening? Uh, now, again, I would not be for saying, hey, contingent faculty, teach this class and sit on this committee and we're not going to pay you anything additional, right? Part of an, a, you know, my position as an assistant professor or Paul's position as a full professor is that we do service, right? So part of our salary is understood to be we do research, we do teaching, and we do service. Um, and so that's, we have a seat at the table. So um, I think that's at least part of something that needs to change. And another thing just to address about Professor Bowen's comment, <clears throat> well, two things, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, the first, right, again, getting back to this common good thing, if you, first of all, it would be impossible to teach 20 courses in an academic year. <laughs> um, like, I don't, there, you couldn't, um, but, to that end as well, even, right, like 
one of the things to consider is at what point does pedagogy get compromised? So if someone has to teach, I think I heard once from a colleague that they were teaching something like nine classes at three different institutions. And, you know, there are ways to fix this. So maybe you're teaching six of the same section or something. So you're only preparing, you know, three different lectures for a week instead of nine different lectures for a week. Anyway, but that idea of quality of work, right, also plays both ways here. Are you putting out something that you're proud to say is your work? But then are you also effectively doing what is being asked of you? Um, so that idea of like, of st student engagement in this as well is also something to think about and, and contributing to the, to the common good. Someone who teaches less courses conceivably can focus on those courses and put more work into them. Yeah. Um, and that's just going to contribute to the overall learning environment yeah. as well. The other thing too, I just want to quickly say is, right, more often than not, students have no idea whether they're professors or adjuncts or not. That shouldn't stop you from asking for a letter of recommendation if you have a, if you have a relationship with a faculty member or of these other things. But it is important to know why someone might say no. It's not necessarily because they don't like you, right? It's because they maybe don't have the time or they're not compensated or, and they're protecting their expertise and time um or things like that yeah. like there's other yeah the yeah. Uh, the other thing right is so we're looking at this from a corporate perspective right the idea that private institutions like universities have moved to more toward a corporate model so that means again there's a consumer and that consumer is our students okay um if the consumers rattle the cage and make noise and demand change you're paying for it right like the corporation will listen um, in that sense that that's the corporate model. So to answer, you know, another thing that to go back to that question is some of the change can come from the consumers of the product. And that is the students. Um, now, how far that will go and or who will listen is you know, a conversation maybe for a different day. But um, that's why, for instance, when you boycott, right, uh, brands for doing X, Y, and Z, or you choose not to, I mean, there's, you know, there's products um, from companies that I won't um, buy from because of something that either has happened, they've stood for or whatever that goes against my beliefs, right? And so in my, my personal values. So I don't engage with that company. So it's the same kind of thing. Um, the other thing to think about too is, and I'm going to throw this, this little nugget out there and see where it goes, is the budget, right? Uh, there are ways in a budget to redesign it so that there, it, there can be a little bit more of an equitable distribution, right? Um, so I think one of the things that Gerald Beyer points out in his book is like uh, your um, uh, coaches or athletic directors at some universities, right, make a ton of money um, and just moving a small percentage of that budget to the contingent faculty boosts them up closer to this idea of a, a equitable and living wage. So they're, there are solutions. It's just, you know, having someone with the ability to, to do that in a group pushing forward the change and um, having institutions listen. Let me, let me draw this to a close with a short anecdote about <laughs> uh, the power of the consumer. 20 years ago, the university was outsourcing its a lot of its uh, janitorial staff to a company that wasn't going to pay particularly well and didn't like unions and the benefits were poor. And actually it was the students who got hold of the story and among other things occupied Bellarmin for a night, much to the annoyance of the senior administrators who operated there and eventually got it overturned. That is, they didn't get overturned, but they got 
the company, the outsourcing company to comply with the requirements that would mean that the people who were going to be outsourced would have pretty much the same salary and conditions as they had had at the university. But what strikes me as something to think about, you should be thinking, you should know whether your faculty are old dinosaurs like me or poor people running around on a bicycle from three different institutions, you should know. But when they occupied Bellamin, I've never forgotten this, they hung a big banner out of the window. And on the banner, it said, this was the students addressing the institution. And it said, practice the values you teach us to live by. That was a terrific moment. There's a great uh, social, socially conscious uh, magazine journal in this country called Mother Jones. And that year, to everybody's amazement, Mother Jones listed Fairfield University as one of the four most politically active campuses in the country. Never since have we been there, but for one shining moment we were. You should think about all these issues and remember the common good. Thank you all for being here. Special thanks to Caitlin and Gail, and uh, see you in a month. Thank you. And thank you online for all being here and paying such close attention.